Please welcome to the stage Yara Tam and Barbara Bayens. Hello, good morning, and welcome to AWS Public Sector Symposium Brussels 2024. I am Yara Tam, leader of the multinational organizations at AWS. And I'm Barbara Byans, leading the public sector team in Bellex. Thank you for joining us today for our sixth public sector focused event here in Brussels. And thank you in light of those transportation challenges, even a greater thank you for you this morning. So today is an opportunity for you to learn, to network, and to engage to help you innovate on behalf of your citizens, students, customers, and more. But before we begin, I would like to take a few minutes to acknowledge our sponsors, because without them, this event would not have been possible. So thank you so much to all our sponsors in the room, our partners. And I would also like to invite you to visit the Expo Hall throughout the day, where you can learn more about what our sponsors have to offer and how they can help you to in your cloud journey. If you've got questions about today's sessions, then you can pass by our Ask an Expert booth where we have experts from AWS on site, on government, on education, on healthcare, for whatever questions you might have, whether you're just starting with the cloud, or you have more difficult questions on advanced technologies like generative AI. And I would also like to feature a digital sovereignty kiosk, where we have a continuity of services kit available with an AWS snowball, so very excited. And then last but not least, I would also like to invite you to join us for the networking reception at the end of the day, also in the Expo Hall. Now, we do have uh, some interesting speakers and content lined up for you today, tailored for Europe and specifically for your needs. With 20 breakout sessions across four different tracks, we have sessions for everyone, whatever your role is or your level of expertise. We have sessions on uh, how to build sustainable solutions, on digital sovereignty, security, zero trust, but definitely also responsible AI and generative AI. So check it out in the app. As always, we are here today in Brussels because of our commitment to the public sector in the region. We know it's an exciting time for Belgium as Bel Belgium takes the presidency of the Council of the European Union. We also know and we understand that our, for our customers in the region, these are challenging times, not only because of uh, the economic uh, challenges, but also because of the weight of the geopolitical conflicts. And as they make decisions around governance, policy, and technology as well. The European Union has been making uh, initiatives, taking initiatives to increase its sovereignty and its resilience to geopolitical events. AWS Cloud is sovereign by design. We are offering more choice to organizations with our advanced sovereign features on the AWS regions worldwide with dedicated cloud sovereign solutions, infrastructure solutions, and with our lately announced AWS European Sovereign Cloud. Dave is going to speak about those a bit more in a little while. We are committed to the communities where we live and work. AWS provides knowledge and tools for all organizations of any size or any industry to build 
solutions and implement solutions that meet their sustainability goals. AWS is offering today the most comprehensive cloud solution in the world and also most broadly adopted, used by millions of people, millions of users every single day they rely on it. Now, did you know that by migrating your IT workloads from an on-premise data center to the AWS cloud can reduce your energy usage and therefore also your carbon emissions by nearly 80%. So that is five times more energy efficient than the average European on-premise data center. We aim to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2040 by investing in renewable energy and collaborating with partners to broaden this impact. Amazon continues to be the single largest consumer of renewable energy. Amazon is also on a path to reach to reach a powering of our operations with 100% renewable energy by 2025. That is five years ahead of our original target of 2030. In fact, did you know that here in Europe, the electricity consumed by all of us of our data centers is already attributable to 100% renewable energy. The cloud accelerates the adoption of renewable energy. And I'll give you an example for that. AWS is teaming up with Wind Europe to tackle major challenges in the energy sector, mainly focusing on uh, improving the process of how renewable, renewable energy projects are being approved and permitted. They have created on AWS a solution which is called Easy permits, a user-friendly digital solution designated for authorities and developer. It is automating and, and digitalizing the whole permit process, and it is expected to reduce the, the administrative uh, workload in up to 50%. It will also allow the agents to take processes of more than three times admissions at one time. We continue to work being water positive by 2030. Now, what does that mean? This means that AWS will be returning more water to the communities where we operate in than we use actually for our consumption, for our production, for our operations. So through our water stewardship work that we've done, we've returned already 3.9 billion liters of water every year back to the community through replenishment projects that we installed and that are underway. And we are also committed to the local communities in the EMEA region. Uh, this, for example, has been done uh, with the disaster recovery work that we did in Greece, but also in Morocco. And on Morocco, for example, the AWS response team, disaster response team, helped to build out a map to help the rescue workers actually with their work um, for the post-earthquake rescue efforts. And we also help to work to train the next generation of tech talent. Now, did you know that AWS already trains more than 1.2 million of people in the European Union alone on cloud skills since 2017? That's both free trainings and paid trainings. But we continue to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in organizing these cloud computing training skill sessions for people. And our goal is to reach 29 million people trained by 2025. And we're on our path to get there with already 21 million people trained worldwide. One of our programs 
to achieve uh, this goal of training, education goals, is called AWS Restart. AWS Restart is a free to the learner, full workflows development plan that helps jumpstart careers in cloud computing. Where, where there's no technology requirement or experience, prior technology experience is, is required for that. AWS Restart has been operated here in Belgium for nearly four years. We have cohorts in the Netherlands, in Poland, in Turkey, and here in Belgium. In Poland, for example, we are working to skill and reskill the Ukraine refugees. In Turkey, the efforts are more focused on educating those who were impacted by the devastating earthquake that happened in 2023. One of the biggest things that people are interested in learning is artificial intelligence, AI. Late last year, we launched AI Ready. It is a new commitment to train with AI skills 2 million people globally. To reach that goal, we are launching new initiatives for adults and for young learners, and we are scaling up our existing free AI skills training. Also, we are pleased to announce that the new and first EU government learning plan is now live. This plan allows more than 60,000 EU government officials the access to more than 30 hours of free education to get them knowledgeable and introduced to AWS Cloud and to generative AI concepts. You can enroll by this QR or you can speak to your account manager about this new program. That's amazing, Yara. But now we're going to hand it over to our Vice President of Public Sector Worldwide, Dave Levy, who's going to talk about some yes, interesting customer cases, success stories from your peers in the region, and also some recent AWS developments and announcements. We also have two great customers that are going to be on stage with him, and we're going to have a demonstration on generative AI. So let's get it started. Please welcome to the stage, Dave Levy. Thank you. Well, welcome and good morning. And, and I just want to thank you, Yara and Barbara, and echo what they said, which is thanks for uh, making the journey today and joining us. And before we get started, I do want to say that the group, the drummers we had this morning, I really wish somebody would give me their telephone number and contact information. I'd love for them to help me wake up my, my kids in the morning and get them ready for school. Uh, I could use that kind of energy and enthusiasm every morning trying to get my kids out of the door. Uh, um, as I said, my name is Dave Levy, and I have the privilege of leading AWS's worldwide public sector business. And uh, this is my first time to Brussels in that capacity. And, you know, European customers have always uh, remained central to our decision making at AWS. And from the European Parliament uh, to the European Commission to the BPOST Group and the World Intellectual Property Organization, we've worked with, with those organizations and many, many more. And we're here today because of our commitment to the region and serving you with solutions and technology. Uh, that are going to improve the lives of citizens, students, customers, and all of your constituents and stakeholders. And if there's just one thing I, I would want you to take away from today, it would be that. It would be commitment. Uh, at AWS, we are uh, profoundly committed to the success of all the communities we serve and all of our customers. And one of the things we talk about most frequently is leaving those customers and communities better than, uh, than uh, when we, we joined in serving them. And so 
Uh, our commitment has been enduring. We will be continue to be committed to, to Europe and the entire world. And uh, knowing that we'll take you on this journey, hopefully today. Now, a little bit about AWS. You know, we built an infrastructure from the ground up. And uh, it's optimized for scale. It's optimized for security and reliability. And that's everything from routers to cooling systems to networking protocols. And it's all designed to help you innovate. Our global infrastructure is fundamentally unique from other cloud providers. In fact, what we like to say is we're, we're hoping to do the undifferentiated heavy lifting of the infrastructure for you. And we offer, to do that, we offer the broadest and deepest set of capabilities that matter to you, our, our customers. And it's like having three times the number of data centers. You saw the statistics around how many data center regions we have around the world. And we have three times the number of data centers around the world compared to the next largest cloud provider. And that makes a difference. That makes a difference in capacity. It makes a difference in availability. It makes, it makes a big difference in reliability. And, and you just heard from Yara that um, we're five times, five times more energy efficient than the uh, average on-premise European data center. And you, know, you not only, so, so by moving to AWS, you not only save money, but you also reduce the carbon footprint. And we offer over 60 more services and 40% more features than the next cloud provider. Now you're gonna hear a lot about security. Uh, security is our very top priority at AWS. And we know it's, it's your priority and top of mind for you too, but public sector organizations are uh, really this, what me and my team think about almost day and night is about the security of our public sector uh, customers. And you can collaborate with us to design solutions that meet security and compliance requirements. And we're doing this all over the, all over the world. Um, it's, it's clear with our shared responsibility model that we protect government data, patient data, financial data, and other highly sensitive workloads. Now, you may have heard before, at Amazon, we are customer obsessed. And what does that mean? That means that we work backwards from your needs to invent with you or invent on your behalf. It's, the, it's a fundamental way that we work with our customers. And we know here in Europe and around the world that sovereignty is top of mind. So giving you, our customers, uh, sovereignty has been a priority for us for, um, for, well, since the very beginning. And when we were the only major cloud provider that allowed customers to control the location and the movement of their data. So 82%, 82% of global organizations are either currently using, planning to use, or considering sovereign cloud solutions in the next two years. And that's according to the global marketing intelligence firm IDC. So we're committed to sovereignty um, without compromise. We're investing in solutions, and we've invested heavily already, but we're investing in solutions in, that help highly regulated industries. Um, we're um, investing specifically for national security and defense, for um, highly regulated uh, customers that have needs around security, compliance, and we've pledged, we've, we've pledged to continue this kind of ambitious investing program, and we've created a roadmap uh, of capabilities for data residency uh, that provide granular access restriction, encryption, and resilience. Now, an example of that is NATO. Uh, NATO school, Oberjamu, um, needed to migrate their website and learning platform. And they did that quickly and securely with AWS using our guidance in something called the Trusted Secure Enclave on AWS. And by using this architecture, 
and working with our partner, Catalyst IT Europe and Identify E2E, they securely migrated to AWS within two weeks. And you can hear more about this in one of the breakout sessions later today. But what's important about that is uh, we had architecture ready for them to, to evaluate, and they could do that with speed, and they could have confidence that it was secure. Now, we're focused on providing customers with more choice. And from our sovereign by design features in, in our AWS regions almost worldwide, this includes dedicated sovereign cloud infrastructure solutions like our recently announced independent sovereign cloud, European sovereign cloud. Now, the AWS European Sovereign Cloud is being launched to provide customers in highly regulated industries with more choice to help meet varying data residency needs, operational autonomy, and resiliency requirements. This is a new, it's a new independent cloud, and it's operated within the European Union, and it will have the same high-end security and availability and performance that our customers get from any existing AWS region today. Now to address some of our public sector and regulated industry customers who need dedicated infrastructure and to help meet their regulatory and compliance requirements, we recently launched AWS dedicated local zones. Now local zones are a type of AWS infrastructure that is fully managed uh, by AWS but it's built to your standards for your exclusive use, where you want it and how you want it, and it's placed in your specified location or data center. It's a dedicated local zone, that, and they meet the same AWS security standards that apply to all regions around the world and, uh, and all local zones around the world. So there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of complexity involved with navigating the evolving digital sovereignty landscape, but you don't have to do it alone. It takes teamwork. Stop by the Digital Sovereignty Zone at the Expo and you can learn more. And we're here to help, and so are our partners. So in addition to all the efforts it, we're leading, our customers can also tap our global network of more than 100 and 30,000 partners worldwide. And they're specialized in various competencies and industry verticals to get local guidance and services that can help you with things like uh, leveraging integrated offerings for architecture and configuring tools and controls. And so now we, we talked a lot about sovereignty, but let's move on to data. AWS works with millions millions of customers to solve some of the most complex problems in the world. They're leveraging massive amounts of data to solve world problems like finding cures to pervasive illness or preventing deforestation. And to get the most value from your data, you need three things. A comprehensive set of tools, tools that account for scale and a variety of data and many ways it will be used. The tools needed to integrate with other services and combine that data are dispersed all over your organization. And you need governance. You need governance to provide the right balance of access and control. And so to make sure customers can store and analyze their data, we have a set of comprehensive data services. Our customers never have to compromise on, on uh, price performance, speed, flexibility, or scale, and can instead simply choose the right tool at the right time for the right job. But building an end-to-end -end stra data strategy doesn't just stop with a broad set of capabilities. It requires you as customers to integrate your data so that you can quickly and easily access it and act on it no matter what, where it resides. This is where customers need to be able to connect the dots between the data sources across various departments and various services. So to empower people, across your organization to use data to the fullest, you, you need both access and control. 
So with robust governance, you can, your organization can give people access to the data they need and only that data, no matter in which database it resides. The Belgian French-speaking radio and television broadcaster, commonly known as RTBF, is at the forefront of public service media recommender systems. Through the use of AWS data services, RTBF offers personalized content experiences across its varied media landscape, including television, radio, and digital platforms. The integration with AWS has enabled RTBF to use the efficiency of tools like Amazon Redshift and Amazon Glue, and paving the way for sophisticated content recommendations tailored, tailored to the preferences of over four and a half million registered users. Another organization using a wide range of AWS data services to innovate their, with their customers is the Belgian Post Group, BPost. And we've got Wendy Yos, their chief data officer, to discuss that journey. Today, the B Post Group is present in 13 countries and has over 36,000 employees delivering 650,000 parcels per day. A small organization has come a long way. B Post has not just grown, it has evolved, adapted, and diversified. Consumption patterns have changed radically in recent years, and consumers have new expectations. E commerce, environmental issues, increased demands in tighter time frames. To meet the needs of as many people as possible, BPost has surrounded itself with the best partners and transformed from a local Belgian postal company with subsidiaries into a group both in Belgium and internationally. BPost Group. Whatever we do, whatever changes we make, we do so with one guiding principle, to connect people in a changing world. A world in which the needs of citizens, companies, and institutions have moved far beyond postal services, and in which our local success is inherently linked to our global achievements. Because that's what makes us move. Please welcome to the stage, Wendy Yos. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to share with you the story of BPost uh, of our data journey. And it's a, a journey that began towards the end of 2019 when we decided that we were fed up with our traditional BI environment because it was old by that time, costly as a result, but also built in silos, very much centered around reporting. And it gave us data in a day plus one system, so we would run all of our transformation processes overnight to then have our data by the next day. And what we really wanted was to have real-time data. We wanted to have a platform that would allow us to do more with our data in terms of business insights and modern technology. Had to be scalable, flexible, but also expandable because BPost is also a group and we wanted to go beyond just Belgium as a data solution. We wanted to have something that we could leverage for the companies within the group. So early 2020, the data team, or the first version of the data team, was created next to the IT team to, pro to give a proper focus to the data domain and separate it from uh, the IT development activities that we were already doing. And this is still the situation today. Um, today, we still very much um, are two teams, separate, but obviously very closely uh, tied to each other. We have very close collaboration, and we are both part of the responsibility of the chief digital officer. Now, what did our journey look like? It was more or less something of a startup approach that we did. So early 2020, we built the first uh, version of, um, of the data platform, put some data on it, especially operational data. We started off with a team that was basically um, just me and 20 people in India. 
And we started testing, trying to make use cases. Um, we chose topics that we knew related to our internal stakeholders because we would then also wanted to use these as showcases to show people what the potential was of using a data platform. And so from 2020 onwards, we uh, focused on new areas. 2021 was a big focus on real time because that was really important to us because of our operational activities. Then moving on to uh, data as a service, analytical models, and uh, recently, uh, I think like many companies, we've started to look into how we can apply AI solutions to our business so that it could make a difference in, um, in people's lives. In the next few slides, I would like to give an example of each of these domains that have really added value to our company um, and were really relevant um, uh, in the solution they offered us. The first uh, big added value was already delivered in 2020, so the year that we started in the end of year peak. So the end of year peak is usually uh, the, you know, the busiest time of the year for Bpost and our other companies throughout the world because it's when everybody starts ordering their uh, their Black Friday deals, and then onwards to all of their Christmas presents. But 2020, as I'm sure you will remember, was the full pandemic. There was a lockdown, uh, shops were closed, and we had unprecedented volumes of parcels in 2020. So much that we really hit the boundaries of our operational capacity. And so, especially in pickup points, parcel pickup points, we needed to extend our network. And we could do that with Decathlon, the Decathlon stores in Belgium who were closed at that time. And so we started using those locations to pick up parcels. The thing is that a few days in, the government decided to reopen the stores. And so Decathlon gave us a call and said, dear people, please remove all of your, your parcels from our stores because we are reopening in a few days' time. We had thousands of parcels stored in all of these locations. And the problem was that we could only distribute them from those locations. It was not an option to feed them all back to our central sorting activities, so we had to distribute and deliver to the homes of the receivers. Our IT system obviously did not know these locations because we were meant to be pickup. And following the traditional IT development cycle, it would take us two to three weeks to adapt the system, and you can do the math, by that time, the end of year peak would be over. Fortunately, we had been playing our data platform uh, with a few models on distribution rounds, organizing distribution. And so, so we were able to reuse uh, a model, adapt it in two days' time, and make two specific models, one based on work time for the rounds done by our own employees, and one based on van capacity for rounds done by contractors. And in less than one week, all of the parcels were distributed to happy receivers uh, of their parcels. So it was not only a quick win, but I think also a lifesaver for, uh, for Bpost at that time. Next example is um, digital twin. So um, this is an example of the use of real-time data. It's a real-time replication of everything that happens in our operational processes, sorting, distribution, transport, but also the warehouse management activities of Radial, which is another company in the group. Um, they're using it throughout their warehouses in Europe. And also their business clients have access to this live tool, so they can follow up on their operations as Radial is fulfilling uh, the activities. Um, this makes a difference in the life of managers, team leads, who day to day have to deal with things that sometimes go wrong, and this really enables them to be proactive and to correct problems before they become a, a real issue. So a big improvement in quality, but also in work experience, because it really gives them a feeling of enablement, being able to do something before, um, before it, goes, it goes wrong. Two more examples on apps that we have. This is the first one, uh, an app for our mailman. It's called My World, because it's centered around the world of a mailman. Um, where we try to interact with a mailman, but also give him or her feedback on how he or she's doing in terms of echo driving scores, NPS scores, customer complaints, but also a gamification aspect of you know, the number of parcels that they've distributed. So we will send uh, a message out just to say, you, know, you had the biggest amount of, of parcels today, or you uh, were done in the shortest amount of time, just to, to also motivate them to do well in terms of, of delivery. Um, and that works, it works really well. So it's also a way to connect to, to people that are always in the field uh, and, and um, to be able to reach out to them in that way. 
And last but not least, the My Bpost app, that is our customer or end receiver app, the people who receive parcels at home, where we've been able to improve our uh, delivery prediction model. We've had a delivery prediction model for some time, but we've been really able to do uh, to produce a much better model with a higher accuracy, and not only predict the time of delivery or the window uh, on the day itself, but as of when one of our business clients creates a label to put on a parcel, we already predict the day of delivery, which is not necessarily the next day. So based on delivery patterns of our own business clients, then we already give the receiver the day that we expect that the actual delivery will, will take place, which is something our competitors not yet do. Maybe just briefly uh, looking back in the few uh, four years that we've had, uh, I think the conclusion is that having a data platform is a real game changer. We've been able to create solutions that we would not have been able to do if we had not invested in a data platform. Real time is an absolute necessity, but also data as a service, uh, feeding intelligence to an IT system, being able to avoid complexity in the, in the development, of an, development of an IT system because you do it on your data platform is a real, uh, a real game changer and obviously being able to work with machine learning models and AI is, um, is very important as well. It was said before, governance is key because we have vast amounts of data. People who love to work with data, they love playing around on a data platform. Um, so you really have to keep a focus on what it is that you're doing and why you are doing it. Also, who you give access to data, very important. Clean it up from time to time. Um, looking forward, what are, how are we going to continue our journey? Well, definitely continue to exploring the different data domains. Predictive remains a very important topic. Applied AI is something uh, uh, we're, we're looking into now. But we're also getting out of the startup mode into a more organized and structured approach now. So that means that also data governance becomes a very important topic and also a data organization. So also in terms of having the right profiles to work with data, uh, not only in the data team, but also within our, our business teams uh, is, a, is a main focus for 2024 20, and then uh, going forward. And last but not least, I forgot to mention it when uh, I showed you the slide, but we baptized our platform the Global Data Nucleus, or briefly the GDN. Global reflects our ambition in terms of the data team to work for the group. We, are, uh, we started out of the Belgian business unit. We've started to work for other subsidiaries, but it is really our ambition to serve all of our subsidiaries around the world with the data platform, that's how it's been constructed. And so in the next few years, we'll be definitely also investing in, in realizing uh, that group ambition. So this is it for now for me, but if you have any questions, do feel free to come up to me today and, uh, and have a chat. I'd be happy to, uh, to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. So I'll, I, I won't re can't repeat the wonderful journey she's been on, but I did hear data, data, data as the foundation and uh, getting your data in the right place and getting, it, uh, getting a governance model around it are one of the foundational keys. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, we, it's, AI has been around for uh, quite some time. Um, and with all of your data, we saw from the example, there's so much potential for innovation, including machine learning and artificial intelligence. And AI adoption is forecast to unleash 600 billion euros of growth in Europe's economy. And AWS has a broad and deep set of AI services. Each of those are purpose-built to address your challenges. We also have a history of innovating for the last 25 years in artificial intelligence. Now that's through our Amazon businesses like our retail business and Alexa. Now, according to a recent survey that we commissioned and released uh, today, as a matter of fact, most organizations will use AI by 2028. 
The, they surveyed organizations think positively about the impact of AI on, on their industries and their businesses, and nearly nine out of 10 surveyed employers and employees see benefits from using generative AI in the workplace. So from data-driven, we expect that organizations will evolve into being AI-driven. The current generation of AI is even more transformative. Generative AI, which you may have heard a little bit about lately and is kind of buzzing everywhere, is expected to become an integral part of the workplace by 2028. The top benefits cited are in task automation and supporting greater innovation and creativity. Now, while AI is expected to offer the greatest value to employees in the IT department, other departments and non-tech employees are also expected to benefit from AI deployments. While eight out of 10 respondents expect to see the benefits of generative AI in IT departments, seven out of 10 workers in non-IT departments are a benefit as well. And so generative AI will truly transform how we work in the future. Now we've worked to democratize generative AI for organizations of all sizes and all technical abilities. And we're doing this by providing the most comprehensive set of capabilities across three layers of the generative AI stack. Now this bottom layer is the infrastructure layer. It's the layer to train large language models and other foundational models and produce inferences and predictions. Data is your differentiator. Uh, it's your differentiator for generative AI when you're building your own large language model. Um, when building your LLM, your data needs to be up to date, it needs to be complete, accurate, discoverable, and available when you need it. And a critical step to achieving that is moving the data into the cloud, having an effective foundation-based cloud strategy will accelerate innovation. Now, the Technology Innovation Institute in the UAE is an example of an organization that worked with us to build their models. They launched the Falcon LLMs, three foundational model, large language models to facilitate research in healthcare, finance, education, and even in some other areas. The, now, this next layer, the middle layer of the stack, this is simple access to all of your models and tools that customers and you will need to build and scale generative AI applications with the same security or access controls and other features that you expect from an AWS service. So since different models work better for different use cases, Customers don't want, what we hear from customers is that they don't want a cloud provider who is beholden to uh, primarily a single model provider. What we've heard is that customers want a real choice of models. Amazon Bedrock is the easiest way to build and scale generative AI applications with uh, large language models and foundational models. Bedrock will provide access to the broadest choice of foundational models from leading companies like Anthropic's Claude 3, uh, family on Amazon Bedrock, Amazon's own Titan models, and the recently announced foundation models from Mistral AI that were developed in France. Bedrock is also designed to support enterprise-grade security and privacy, and as an example, no customer data is used to train or improve the original base model. Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG, with knowledge bases is now generally available. RAG with knowledge base bases is another technique for customizing models in Bedrock. It allows organizations to have a foundation model and consider new knowledge from their enterprise data when offering responses. It, it lets your organization tap into multiple data sources like document repositories and databases. And finally, at the top layer of this stack, 
we've been investing in applications in key areas like generative AI-based coding, so uh, and Amazon Q. And I'm going to have Dom talk to you a little bit more in detail about Q, which we're very excited about, and, and Code Whisper. Come on up. Thanks, Dave. Really excited to be here today. Uh, in my role as Global Vice President for Public Sector, I have the privilege and honor to be working with many of the technical people that work with you to help you figure out how to best leverage a platform to accomplish your mission. In this case, we're going to talk a little bit about how to use the AWS platform and our new artificial intelligence services, particularly generative AI, in order to do some really unique and creative things around some of the activities that you're trying to perform. One of the things I'd like to do is mention the way that we're leveraging all of these different LLMs and models from across the spectrum. Dave mentioned the Mistral AI, which is one of the most recent AI models developed here in Europe. And one of the things we're super excited about with Mistral's AI is it's one of the fastest, scalable, and most efficient models we've ever seen. One of the things we love about our Bedrock service is this ability to adapt and leverage new models as they appear and make them available for you. But you know, enough talking about these different models, let's see a demo. I'm really excited to show off a demonstration that's been built by two of my solution architects here in Europe. Maria and Inez have put together an example of how you could build an application using generative AI to accomplish things in your mission. What we've got here is a demonstration that, that leverages some content that you would then potentially upload and then use for training. In this case, I've taken a video about generative AI, building generative AI applications. I upload the video to the system. As I page through the video, kind of stepping through it, you can see this is about how to build generative AI applications on AWS. And you can see some good pictures, bullets, all kinds of things that talk about ways you can do this. And obviously, there's a, someone who's a lecturer or a talk track that's going through this presentation. What we've done is uploaded it to our generative AI service. And we can see at the bottom are these little buttons that have appeared that have processed this video so it can be used for benefit and used for activities. Let's take a look first at the transcript that was produced. So you'll see the demo will move down, it'll click on transcript, and now it shows you using Amazon Transcribe the full content of the lecture. It has a lot of technical content, including percentages, numbers, and you can see it does a quite a good job. Second, we have the summary, which produces learning objectives and bullet points, the highlights of this presentation. Another nice thing about thinking about ways you have to focus on and say, what is emphasized? We go to flashcards. Created here are flashcards that can test the student to say, here's a question about the content, here's the answer that you can use. Now, I built all this in English, but of course, uh, my solution architects speak other languages as well, and they said, let's show it in French. So here are the flashcards automatically translated using Amazon Translate into French, and of course, now it's sound as well. Quel est de cette série de vidéos Apprendre aux clients à créer des applications via génératives. Quelles sont les fonctionnalités So that uses Amazon Polly to make the, the content much more accessible for people who want to listen to it as well. And then lastly, I have something called Assistant. Assistant lets me ask questions of the content as if I was watching the lecture and could raise my hand and say, what was this, what was, what this content said? Question I can start out in French, I get a French answer. Even though the content of the lecture itself was in English, it auto-translates my question, auto-translate the answer to that question. Even though that may not have been content in there, it generates the answer, translates the answer, and provides it. I can switch back to English, ask the same type of question, and then also get that answer now in English, in which it, and, and then have this, have this discussion with the lecture content. So you could see how powerful this would be if you're creating training videos that you want people to interact with and not just sit there and click through them and have a test at the end, but give them assisted things like flashcards, the ability to interrogate the content, and also get a summary through the transcript. I think it's a really powerful demo of how you can use our foundational AI services to build real-world applications that can be used inside your organization. You can imagine the possibilities not only for government, but for education, healthcare, and nonprofits, which to me is really exciting. So I mentioned, you know, how can generative AI be used in the public sector? And we gave an example here of a learning experience. We're also seeing use cases like this in government, healthcare, and nonprofits to say, how can I do things like member drives, do things like summarizing legislation, 
all kinds of wonderful activities can be built on top of these general, gen foundational generative AI technologies. One of the most impressive bits of technology that I'm excited to work with and work with you on is something we call Amazon Q. Amazon Q is a broad name that describes a bunch of different services that leverage all of our foundational AI capabilities to give you a new capability on top of each of these new language models. In many cases, Q leverages multiple models to provide answers for you. I'm gonna go through the way that we've started to use Q in many of our services. We've already integrated it into four of our services, and you can expect to see many more in the months to come. One of the things uh, we're gonna talk about at first is Amazon Q as a business enabler. One of the things that Amazon Q can do from a business perspective is reach out and connect into your business systems. Amazon Q today already has 40 different connectors that can talk to services like S3, Salesforce, Microsoft 365, ServiceNow, Gmail, Slack, Atlassian for Jira tickets and stuff from your software development cycle, and Zendesk. It respects all of your existing controls on those systems, but allows some of your users and the people in your organization to basically ask questions of your business systems by virtue of the way it's connected to them and provide answers that then can take action through some of our agent capability to do things like create a ticket, open a support case, and document it. The second area where we've applied Amazon Q is in building applications. This is an enabler for your builders and developers. It was trained on over 17 years worth of Amazon knowledge, the questions and answers that were asked of us through our repo system, as well as experts across AWS who helped train the model to understand technical questions to provide technical answers, giving you information basically from the Amazon documentation and different code samples and snippets so that the, uh, the knowledge base here is based on helping your builders and developers. And now also true to this is something we call Code Whisperer, which is an augmented capability for developers to leverage generative AI to be more productive. Our partner worked with the European Commission's Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, and they started to generate high quality code, 30% faster development for each developer, huge efficiency gain, and with more than 90% accuracy, lowering the, inf uh, the uh, incidence of bugs and other problems that have to be solved in, in writing software. Super powerful creativity. But we didn't just stop there. We've also enabled Q for developers to do things like code transformation. This is super exciting for things where we have to keep systems up to date and maintained. If you've ever had a system where you've had to go from Java 15 to Java 17, you know, there's a lot of work in like looking at all the signatures in the code, figuring out what needs to be changed, how to develop test cases. One of the things Q for code transformation can do is explain the code to you. You can ask it, what does this code do? And it'll produce documentation about what function is being performed. You could then say, generate test cases to make sure that this works well. So all of this kind of code coverage helps you maintain a system, which we know is over a life of a system really takes down the level of effort to keep a system live, fresh, and going for you. Another place where we've applied Amazon Q is in our call center product, Amazon Connect. This is a generative AI concept, contact center agent assistance capability. This allows your agents to have real-time conversations with your knowledge base that helps answer customer questions in real time. It allows you to onboard agents faster because the essential knowledge and training is built within the product and can be interacted with in a natural language fashion. This helps your customer agents respond more quickly to questions and helps onboard them that much faster. The last area so far that we've introduced Amazon Q into is our QuickSight or business intelligence product. One of the things we've heard from customers is I'd love the ability to tell a story with data. People really are tired of static dashboards, pie charts, and pictures that they do in presentations. They want to be able to ask questions of data and quickly present things that are relevant and motivating when you say, how can I show this data in a fashion that exhibits a trend? And so now with Amazon QuickSight, you can use Amazon Q as a way to say, this is the kind of dashboard I'd like to show. This is the story I'd like to tell about my data. Please build a dashboard that evidences and shows off a of data in the way I'd like to have it presented. 
This is her super powerful capability to not only enable IT folks like your developers with Amazon Q, but end users and business analysts who need to produce information based on data can leverage this generative AI capability to tell their data story. We're gonna be zooming Amazon Q to many more services across AWS, and I hope these four examples show you that we're committed to leveraging generative AI to improve all of our services for your benefit so that you can be more innovative. But what if you'd actually like to get your hands dirty today in a much more easier way? Now, obviously, this demo that was built by My Solution Architects is super impressive, and I can tell you it's really easy to get started, and you can go there as well. But if you'd like to really get some hands-on capability, I recommend you check out something called Party Rock. Party Rock is an easy way for you to build simple Genervaya applications. You literally just describe what you'd like the application to do, and Party Rock actually builds code to show you a sample application that achieves the result that you're looking for. It could be something as simple as writing poems, describing your music collection. One of our vice presidents actually uses it to determine the ferry schedule in Seattle. So I hope you take advantage of this. Check out partyrock.aws and experiment yourself and see what creative things you can build. I hope that exploration of generative AI was informative to you, not only on what can be done, but also how we're embedding generative AI into all of our services so they're easier for you to innovate with. But you know what, I'd like to move on from that and talk about how moving from the cloud, moving to the cloud from on-premise infrastructure opens the door to this kind of innovation. Our next speaker is gonna share how their journey into the cloud led to a positive shift in their entire IT culture. From World Intellectual Property Organization, I'd like to welcome to the stage their Chief Technology Officer, Francesca Dury. Please welcome to the stage, Francesca Dury. So welcome everybody. Thank you for having me here. And uh, as uh, was just said, I'm gonna to talk to you about what comes before being able to exploit uh, artificial intelligence and generative AI in an efficient way and that's uh, the move to the cloud. And I, I'm quoting myself <laughs> in that, uh, in my long experience. You find out that you made the right technology choice uh, when you get more benefits and additional benefits with respect to the benefits you were expecting from that technology in the very beginning you get something that you weren't expecting. So WIPO is not just about filing patents and trademarks. We believe that intellectual property should be deployed at, for the benefit of everyone, everywhere. We serve 193 states and our initiatives range from filing hundreds of thousands of patents, uh, but also helping creators uh, protect their intellectual property, helping indigenous people protecting their intellectual property, uh, supporting uh, the Accessible Books Consortium to make uh, sure that applications are accessible to people that uh, would uh, uh, be, uh, for, for people for whom it would be difficult to access normal publications. We are digital, all of our services are digital, and we deliver our services through application that we develop for the most part ourselves. And back in 2018, it became clear that in order to be more efficient, uh, we had uh, to move to the cloud. It's not been an easy journey. As I said, we started in 2018, and that was the year where we built the foundation. Building the foundation meant to adopt a cloud-first policy, 
to build a landing zone, to learn about uh, what architected framework, uh, and to put an internal governance in place uh, for whoever wanted to deploy or migrate their applications to the cloud. Uh, now, today, we have more than 70 applications deployed in the cloud. We have a data lake, we, and the cloud enables us to build a data lake and a data analytics capability. Uh, but it was a long journey in between. And uh, in 2022, we faced uh, a dilemma. What was the situation by then? In 2022, we were you know, mature enough for all new applications to be cloud native. And uh, for the, our major application, the application uh, through which we deliver most of our services, to be in the process of being migrated to the cloud. But the pace of migration was not the pace we wanted really to be, and uh, our infrastructure, our base services were still mostly on-prem. And that was impacting not just the speed, but also some of the benefits, such as, for example, reliability. Having, you know, applications in the cloud, but the base services that were supporting them still on-premise meant that we weren't able to get the reliability that we were looking for. And that was a year where, you know, it took a leap of faith or a little bit of, you know, forcing the path forward through a project that is not uh, what you will get from the literature or the best practices because, you know, it's quite clear that uh, lift and shift is not the ideal way of migrating to the cloud. But sometimes you don't have uh, the time or you don't have the resources to refactor or, you know, rebuild everything. And, uh, and the purpose of this move was to get a big acceleration. And through this project uh, and through our uh, migration, we got more benefits in reality than what we were expecting. So by migrating to the cloud, and specifically uh, with, this, uh, with this mass migration project, what, what were we looking for? Of course, we were looking for more agility and flexibility, so being able to deploy, to build new applications in a very limited amount of time. We were looking for improved service to our stakeholders, and the way we measure, the, uh, when we measure our service, the quality of our service, uh, is with the AppDex index, uh, so we measure the experience of all of our customers all over the world, for us being really, uh, you know, treating all of our customers in all 193 countries the same is very, very important. And of course, we were looking for better business uh, um, continuity and, and, uh, and, but, and optimizes our cost. And those were the benefits we realized. But what were the benefits that we got as a bonus, let's say? Uh, new solutions to old problems. I'll just give you an example, an on-premise solution that is a, is a global database where, where you provide search on a global database of brands. And this service gets uh, attacks by bots. And the application teams, they were fighting to counteract <laughs> to those, those, those attacks. And we just simply, very, very quickly, were able to put a web application firewall in front of the application. So they have, even if the application was still on-prem, deploying the web application firewall in the cloud delivered immediate benefits. Uh, the mass migration project uh, meant uh, that we had, to, had to, to, to have our hands dirty in old applications, old servers, and that helped us a lot to reduce our technical debt a lot. And I, if you are in IT and you've been in IT long enough, you know that you know, getting rid of technical debt is probably one of the most difficult things. That all of us have these uh, skeletons uh, in the cupboard we would really like to, be, to get rid of. We got cost avoidance uh, and that you know, our new solutions uh, are really very much uh, pay as you go. We don't build anything new. And uh, we got better architecture practices. We had, as I said, to put a strong governance uh, at the very beginning of our journey. The result is that our whole architecture practices improve. All of our applications and architectures are now documented. They all go undergo a formal approval, architecture approval process. That improves our security, of course, as well. And that was something that 
got really a push from the migration to the cloud. And last but not least, uh, uh, involving also the operational teams and not just, not, not just the development teams in, with this, uh, let's say, mass migration project, uh, we, got, uh, we upskilled them with real work where they were really learning on the job side by side uh, with, uh, with the professional services that helped us. And it was a little bit of a team building exercise. So our, let's say, if, if I can summarize uh, the, the final result that we got uh, is uh, moving really from what was at the very beginning a cloud-first policy to a cloud-first mindset in that, you know, we think about solving problems uh, cloud-first. That's immediate. It's a mindset. Thank you. Well, if you're ready uh, to get rid of some of those skeletons in the cupboard, um, we are here to help you. Um, I just really appreciated the story and the journey uh, that you just described. And it is a journey. And I wanna say that uh, we're here to help you along that journey uh, on the decisions that you need to make, on the time that, uh, that it will take, uh, my teams and I are standing by and our partners as well to help you. So thanks again for joining us today. We hope you learned something new from our conversation or we inspired you uh, to want to learn more. And like Yara and Barbara mentioned, we've got four tracks uh, of great content throughout the day, a robust expo and so much more to explore. And if you don't know where, <coughs> excuse me, if you don't know where to start, stop by the AWS Village or the Ask the Expert booth in the Expo, and we're here to help you figure out your next innovation or work through any challenge that you have. You can bring us your ideas, no matter how formulated they are, we've got you covered. So let's get started experimenting, give Party Rock a try. I, I can share with you, if you can find me with some of the things that I've put into Party Rock, uh, if you promise to keep it confidential. Um, and hopefully we'll get to share your story on stage next year. Enjoy the event today and thank you for joining us. <laughs>